Okay, hello everyone, welcome to <coughs> today's episode. From new knowledge, uh, excuse me, from old, <laughs> from old knowledge to the new unknown. And <clears throat> today I, this morning I noticed something about inner strength and outer uh, strength, which uh, relates to how human beings are living. You see, I thought about the idea of knowledge and how we had to first not know. That means when we look at ourselves and the evolutionary scheme of things, first there was an unconscious world, then an unconscious self, then a conscious self, then a conscious world. We didn't know we were like space, <clears throat> like an empty space inside a room. As existence and expressionism through the commands of time uh, displayed themselves, <laughs> <coughs> this space of unknown view has been filled with content. I can tell you that when I wake up in the morning, even though we uh, consider ourselves as human beings. We are in the linguistic simulation. We, we treat ourselves as names and individual ideas and characters in a story. But when I wake up, it is the simplest presence of attention. That means there is no input unless there was a dream and the dream is still lingering in the attention as the person wakes up. For me, novelty cannot exist without the unknown. That means if this world was in a, in a set way where everybody is, it was set in stone how we knew things, then there would be no new knowledge. It would just be the same. And when you look at reality, that's the thing. Either things are following past innovations or they're being innovative in the current moment in, in modern times. So what I'm trying to say is, first there is space, then the space gets filled, then we're like, yay, knowledge! <laughs> so here's the idea. We have old knowledge. That means we started setting the world in stone. We started shaping the meaning of what we were seeing that was meaningless. <clears throat> now what has happened is it has become an institutionalized and systemized way of knowing now. Now I would say knowledge is fashion. But there was a time where knowledge had a merit on its own. That means it, it was like, it wasn't for a fashionable reason that people wanted to know more. <clears throat> they actually wanted to know more because they noticed they were temporary and you're here once to figure the whole thing out. You only get one chance at the cosmic problem and every day happens once. <clears throat> now this doesn't mean that we spend a whole lifetime being like, is it known? Is it unknown? <laughs> I just feel that there was a space that from the beginning was free. This space has been filled and if it doesn't empty, if you don't empty the cup, it, let's say there's, I don't know, tea in it, okay? <clears throat> a cup half full of tea, you know? It's like if you want to pour orange juice into that cup, you got to rinse. You got to rinse the cup if you don't want the previous knowledge to get infused with the new. That means I feel that there's a magnificence at work here. 
this magnificence doesn't mean we immediately give all attention to <clears throat> a symbol of the divine you know this eight what i would say is that existence is like <clears throat> a horse you're on you know and this horse is running you know you're riding this horse now throughout while riding this horse you could suddenly close your eyes <clears throat> and so in existence we have experiential activation and deactivation that means you know we are active in the morning then we become inactive as the day goes unless there is another energy line unless the person has is their inner realms are creating energy for them i speak about this that a person's mind is not just the administrator it can also be the fuel of the body you know this is more closer to <clears throat> ideas of qi or chi chi gong do you know that there is a relationship on an energetic level with the meaning of the phenomenological realm you know that means for me it's like you go see these shaman monks they would use chi to do some next level things you know chi different there's different ways in japan they call it chi Old knowledge needs to be challenged in order for new knowledge, which is the unknown, to come. So we should see it as, 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 as the psychological entity oscillating between uh, <clears throat> a stable existential living and a non-stable, flexible experiential living. So what does that mean? That means how you have experienced existence so far and the way you know it, it has to, the, 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 what's in the cup has to be rinsed out and then the new can be poured in. <clears throat> I feel that was, um, this is the main transformation. A lot of people uh, from uh, the mystical uh, <clears throat> branch of thought they, in some sense, stop being a person before they have actually found the world. So it's like you can say religion is trying to get to heaven. <clears throat> Mysticism, spirituality is wondering who is getting to heaven before you get to heaven. And that question makes you wonder how you have set the world in motion uh, archetypally uh, with structure and design, you know. That means it's like a, a person who's experienced having a father, for example, or a grandfather, that's an archetype, you know, that's an archetype. Anytime you see a person, they remind you of your grandfather, that grandfather archetype is being evoked. You know, some, a certain way the person had defined something, they had familiarized themselves in a certain way with something, when they see that familiar pattern again, that uh, archetype emerges. Just like the same way we say, like I say the word apple and people know what that means. But if you didn't know English uh, or the word, you'd be like, what is the sound entering my ear? <laughs> Knowledge is conditional. We can say we know we are human beings because we're being human beings. And one of the great mysteries of, I would say, for the Homo sapien, for this evolving entity, is how much it's going to permit itself beyond the conscious framework of evolution it has had. You know, sometimes I think about it, what if there has been an oscillation? What if we don't realize this? What if consciousness peeps like a dolphin, jumps out of water for like a couple hundred couple thousand years then like a dolphin dive, dives back into the earth you know <laughs> you know i mean uh, that would be insane if you saw a dolphin like you know jumping up water you know you know 
uh, above the water, back into the water, above the water, the dolphin's getting close to the beach. Then you begin to see the dolphin is diving into the sand and jumping up out of the sand of the beach. Literally imagine a do dolphin, a, a dolphin, <laughs> a dolphin um, <clears throat> I don't know, swimming in the sand. I don't know. <laughs> Now, how does this relate to inner strength and outer strength? <clears throat> you see, if I choose to see the human position as just purely singular, if I choose to see I am this, because I have causally seen myself as this, I can't see anything else. That means the moment you brand someone as good person, they're good. Whenever you see them, you're like, oh, good goodness. You know? <laughs> but when you brand someone as bad, same thing. You know, you look at that person and you're like, I don't like that person, you know? But what it is, is we don't like how our mind is around others. Never the other person because we don't know them. Unless it's in the outer realms and it's physical and that's different. You know, physical confrontation, that means uh, we shouldn't forget as much as we talk about peace, compassion, and <clears throat> universal love, we shouldn't forget we're still animals here. <laughs> you know, like I totally understand why Jordan Peterson says, you know, it's like, <clears throat> be a good person, but also be dangerous. When he says dangerous, that means have the potential to evoke different levels of energy and intensity. For me personally, <clears throat> I would say when it comes to activities of the mind, I, I, uh, when it comes to living as a mind moving your body, I am way more fierce than living as a body <clears throat> holding a mind around. That means it's two choices. Either you are in your natural resonance or you are in something other than yourself's natural resonance. Everything is natural here, but the nature has an ability to direct. So your free will is <clears throat> pointing your attention. That's choice. Sorry guys, this was on mute. Uh, I kind of lost track of how far the audience heard. So this was on mute and I was talking. Uh, I was attempting to answer Jules' question. I don't know if that part was recorded. Um, anyways, I'm going to go on instead of rewinding. Um, <clears throat> so Joel says, do we rinse our minds before intaking new knowledge or after noticing things we need to change about our thinking? I don't know how much of it... I don't know if you guys heard me answering that, but if, if so... I would say here's the thing either we go towards something new or we update the old 
if we update the old, it will never be new, new. It will be newer, but it will never be new. That means you're keeping the past. When I say <clears throat> from old knowledge to the new unknown, that means it's like a, a human being waking up and being like, whoa, 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 whoa. How many ideological systems that are currently active and influencing the human experience that are old? Do you know that means, isn't it interesting that we don't like wearing old clothing? People like to wear new clothing, but when it comes to the mind, it's, it's so easy to be dressed in old clothing, old knowledge. <clears throat> that means there's certainty, of course. You know, there is, um, it's so easy to say, I know this. You know, I know exactly things are going to be like that. I know this. You know, that's, it's like there's no fun in it, you know in knowing things in a world that's changing. To know everything in a changing world technically means you can't be surprised. <clears throat> so there's a huge chance God is bored. Of course, guys, I'm, I'm speaking um, as a philosopher, therefore respectfully, but I would say, <clears throat> I'm simply saying, guys, that um, think about it. How do you become a new person? Let's think about that. How do you become new? Is there anything new? Honestly, if I was materialist, if I had an incredibly just allegiance to materialism as the only causal position that means considering that matter was here before a mind then it's done then it's like you can't you have nothing else no tolerance for new imagery that means if you're in one room of a mansion cosmic mansion you're in one room of that mansion and <clears throat> you feel that room is the totality of the universal perception. Oh my God, this room in this cosmic mansion is the observable universe. All of our knowledge is from this. But what if all of our knowledge is commentary on the tip of the iceberg? That is, the, that is my view. That we are, from the beginning, an illusion of the truth. We are a dream... of something that is not individual to dream. It's like we are the dream of our awakening. That means our awakening is dreaming. <laughs> and of course, here's the thing. Right now, we are under the assumption because we're not conscious that we are beyond language. We are, uh, language has to specifically uh, meet the outer realms, but it is never 100% accurate. In a changing world, language can't contain it. That means if language was a mask, this mask doesn't fit on the face of the cosmos. And for us to just call it cosmos, call it universe, how cute. We named the void and we think we know things. You know, <clears throat> as far as I'm concerned, all human knowledge, and this may be a bit of a chaotic statement to say, but it's no problem if we think we're in the cosmos, right? <laughs> <clears throat> that really language was a discovery. Language is a method. It's a method of an unknown being to know itself. <clears throat> it's a communication of an inner realm. I use this example often. I say, uh, I mean, linguistic professors, um, those of the likes of Steven Pinker, I believe Noel Chomsky even made a point of this, that there was, lang there was meaning before there was language. <clears throat> what does that mean? That means you, you saw a person and then you named the person. You didn't just put a name to the void, you know? That means there was an image. So if there was meaning before there was language, that would mean like a caveman. Imagine a primitive ancestor of ours, you know, seeing another caveman and being like they don't have language, they don't have vocabulary, they don't have 
<clears throat> even individualism to that complex level of identification. But it's it's like the language wasn't there, but the caveman saw another caveman, saw a rock falling on the caveman or a saber-toothed tiger jumping out of the bush. And the caveman was like, oh, oh, oh. Do you know, like it was, it was, there was no language, but there was meaning. Something was going on that had some sort of meaning to it prior to the language emerging, right? So this ability for us to make sound a subjective symbol and the actual physical thing be the same thing, that was a discovery. That's like us learning to make fire. We learn to connect these three things, you know, these three dimensions. So, if language, uh, if there was meaning before there was language, that meaning is a suggestion of an inner experience. What does that mean? That means in front of our eyes, it is true. We are in a physical world as a physical self. But behind our eyes, we are having opinions. We are seeing probabilities to this self. That means it is true. I don't deny that I'm a physical being here, but my mind is seeing different ways this physicality can move. The mind, the, what is going on is there seems to be an inner realm that matured first, then the outer realms emerged. So it could be <clears throat> that a mind is the precondition to the world, but even in the outer realms. So if you think that there is a mind, if here's the thing, for me, <laughs> the secular and the non-secular that endlessly are in, in a sort of language war, one is believing that the whole world is in a mind, the other believes that the world is in a self, and that self is in a mind. That means really, <clears throat> either we see additional dimensions, either we see this realm as if like, either we see it as a light beam, uh, where it's just one ultimate world, the world of man, the world of the human being, or we see it as the light going into the prism and becoming the color spectrum, Therefore, meaning that one world is simultaneously many worlds. That means when we look at it on a subatomic level, the, that which was one atom has become many other things. When we look at the body, we say my body so casually, but this body is the movement of various organs, various systems. Your nervous system, your cardiovascular system, the doctor's system. So there is so many... Uh, so many uh, uh, systems simultaneously working to be an individual. <clears throat> and we are here saying an individual purpose. Let's say there was an individual purpose to life. Let's say you were a person and you were like, my purpose was, uh, you found the purpose in your life. Your purpose was to, I don't know, <clears throat> do a specific thing, right? You would see that activity is divided. That means, I'll give you an example. Let's say you're uh, Edison and you invent the light bulb. And you're the moment you invent the light bulb, you're like, no way. It was my purpose to build this. You know? <laughs> okay? So that is true. We can look at it and say it was Edison's life purpose is the where, where he was positioned in her history. He managed to lead to that outcome. Right? Now, the thing is, though, we say Edison's life purpose was to build... The, invent the light bulb but when we really look at what the invention of the light bulb is it was also Edison's life purpose to go find the materials for the light bulb to go also sketch the light bulb do you know that means there is um, again similar to seeing an atom there is we are seeing an event I called this in another talk eventum and this eventum we're seeing the eventron <laughs> we're seeing different particles so what that means is Either your purpose is a light beam or that light beam is a color spectrum. You're attaining, you're moving towards the purpose that way. If it's if you see an atom has smaller parts and then you see an event, which we are declaring as the life purpose also having smaller parts, that means 
like my body is a purpose but also my heart has a purpose my uh, liver has a purpose my skeleton has a purpose do, do you see <clears throat> now if we are defined by old knowledge we have missed the future that's the thing anytime I believe let's say today I start believing there's a ice caramel macchiato in front of me. Let's say I, let me say I, I believe ice caramel macchiato is the only truth. Nothing else exists in this universe other than ice caramel macchiato. You know, I start believing this, and every day, every day, people ask me, Mister Within, what do you think of Nietzsche? I'll be like, ice caramel macchiato. What do you think of God? Ice caramel macchiato. Ice caramel. And that belief denies me from experiencing all the unknown and new ways. That this the moment can be <clears throat> and it's not easy you know when it comes to the outer realms there is a way more complex situation there you know because the outcomes are more real when I'm here it's like it's, it's very easy to speak about skydiving but actually skydiving is another intensity and totally separate from how it can be spoken That means if there was a way to transfer experience instantaneously, that means imagine there's an app in the future that you can instantly experience a person's emotion. So when somebody's skydiving, they live stream their emotions and everybody around the world can feel what it's like to skydive. You know, or imagine the first person to go and do a backflip in Mars, like uh, we on Earth all can experience the live stream emotions of that person can you imagine that means right now even in, in NASA uh, or these um, international space uh, flight kind of initiatives uh, what it is is they don't see the psychology of the person this is why they need to wait for the person to speak you know language is really our voices or how we uh, ex uh, share our emotions with one another <clears throat> voice and pitch tone all of those are important So if I could instantly transfer an inner realm experiential event, even though if it's retained in the memory, then I would have no need to give these talks. No need. Because the point of life is not to put endless images in front of your face and feel satisfied. The point is to notice the experience is between the known and the unknown. Because the unknown is here, the known can't be the ultimate. That means it's fine. We can know endless things. You know, there could be, imagine, like, we go through a phase where all religions leave. Imagine all religions dismiss themselves out of conception, out of linguistic conception. Then imagine thousands of years of nothing, no ideological specific system, you know, <clears throat> alt, uh, 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 an uh, absolute ideological system. And then we see suddenly there's a resurface. That means what it is, is nature doesn't have man's mind. That means I could think like, I, you could look at a grizzly bear and be like, grizzly bear, don't hurt me. But you think the grizzly bear understands? So you see, it's uh, it's reality, the reality of the unknown setting in, you know, adjusting to this. Because that's what we're all headed, uh, excuse me, but ended, um, headed for. We are, we are right now in a known position, yay, we got names, we got stories, we got personalities, we got civilization, you know, we got society, you know, but we all know that the candle wax will melt and the opportunity of being a mind at some point will be the same. When I was younger, the framework I perceived the world, the world I, I would say I was a Bhakti Yogi, you know, where devotion, love <coughs> was uh, very important. <clears throat> but you can love 
until you see that there is a design issue. Do you know? That means there is something that <clears throat> I feel sometimes, uh, especially yoga does this. I'm trying to bypass this error I consider a mystical thought. That so many people say they love the world, but if you really ask them, they're trying to leave the world. <clears throat> How many people, they are acting like they love the realm, you know? So many people, uh, I'll tell you something personally, in um, uh, my background is from Iran. Iran is a theocratical society. Religion is in the laws, therefore there is a religious atmosphere everywhere, you know? So in this religious atmosphere, I can tell you, <clears throat> that there are people who are, uh, it's as if the child was given something. It's like children who never rebel, never experience who they could be. Anyways, what I'm trying to say was that <clears throat> so many people were thinking, I, I remember in Iran, you know, many people, uh, so of course, you know, there's secular people everywhere. But I'm saying in, in Iran, if you were to casually go on the street, most people are trying to be good religiously to go to heaven. I'm not joking. Like, it's seriously. They are seriously putting the efforts of their life to behave in a conduct that they will go to heaven. Right? <clears throat> but the thing is... <clears throat> And they, I would say, I've seen very compassionate religious people. There's many different psychologies. I mean, religion is just ink on a page. It's the human brain. It's the mind. It's the person who animates the language, who brings the thought to life. You know? <clears throat> I would say there were people who cared for the world. They were good people, but they were not heading. They did not want to be in the world. They wanted to go to heaven. And sometimes it feels like wanting to go to heaven is like not wanting to be on earth, which is the most ungrateful view if you were religious to the Creator. You see, I thought about this, that in, in many religious narratives, it is said that God's creation is, in, from a theological view, is perfect. God's will. You go into a religious community, it's as if God is moving people. You know, people are not moving people. You know, every person's free will, whether they know it or not, is the divine will. You know, it's a declaration of a universal mind prior to the individual mind. <clears throat> that means the collective mind is in charge in the religious view. And then the individual mind has freedom. You know, but I would say in the secular view, the individual mind is as freedom is first, and then the collective mind emerges from that. You know? But what I'm saying is, there is no point to this. I think this is an artificial view where people act like they love the world, but they don't want to be in it. They want to go somewhere else, you know? They act like they have found the source of love, oneness, truth, collectivity, yet they are, they don't, they are not accepting of the, how they are a person. So what I'm telling you is non-duality has become escapism from humanhood because if the non-duality was truly realized, you can't have an opinion, behavioral opinion on it, on non-duality. Non-duality is not for a person. True enlightenment, as the concept was there, nirvana means nothingness. <clears throat> that means it's not a person that is enlightened. It's a presence. You're noticing how the presence of light in your eyes is being existential animate, animate being. <clears throat> so, guys, just to finish up that point on, on the commentary on the religious angle, if you love the world, why are you trying to leave it? If you believe in God's creation to be perfect, why do you think it needs to have a second opinion? You see, for me, language... The, the, the human consciousness is older than language. So if language attempts to, uh, to define some phenomena that existed way before the dimensions of language could exist to explain it, <clears throat> I am saying that there is idea, uh, idol worship 
and there is idea worship. And massive amounts of human beings are possessed by the language of their ecosystem. And the reason they're possessed by it is because they are young and there's emotions. And when the person, you can think of it that the child first speaks an emotional language, you know, that means the child feels the moment. The child, even a, a new infant, needs to be um, hugged by the mother or the infant, like, doesn't grow properly. That means temperature, a sense of uh, not being alone in existence, you know, especially for the new infant. So there's an emotional language. Now, some people speak this emotional language very well. Some people don't. I could tell you I am emotionally, in certain, <laughs> certain social settings, illiterate. Do you know what that means is I don't have an opinion, I don't have a desire, so I don't exist as a self in the moment. Do you know? So I can tell you, but, this doesn't mean the person doesn't care. It just means the person is not in the in a be. It doesn't have a behavioral attachment to what they care about. Uh, in the chat section, Lorna says, <clears throat> "Do you think we all have powers like Jesus and others, like witches who were burned at the stake, scientists who were beaten and imprisoned, all those ridiculed for knowing these powers and using?" Um, <clears throat> interesting question. Here's the thing, when it comes to power, in yogic thought, I mean you're talking about powers in regards to like walking on water or something, right? So there was this saying in yogic thought, only in yogic thought I've, I've seen this in Vedanta, where they say they don't deny there is powers. They're like, yeah, you meditate for a while, you notice where you are existing and you notice the nature of your mind, you're gonna have abilities. But the issue is using these abilities means you haven't understood what the nature of the universe is because it's a non-dual source. I shouldn't say source, center, non-dual center. There's a quote from Carl Jung, guys. Let me find this, this quote is epic. There we go. <clears throat> this is Carl Jung. He says God is an infinite. Oh no, wait. Let me pull it up. Yeah, I think it's Carl Jung. He says God is an infinite sphere, the center of which is everywhere, the circumference nowhere. That means truth is a point. Belief is the degrees and what is nature the nature of the outer realms is like the circumference that is endless so the central source of meaning in the moment is what young Carl Jung was seeing as God <clears throat> and this can only happen if the person feels empty That means the inner realms and the outer realms become unconditional. <clears throat> In the outer realms, existence is conditional. That means you need to actually survive physically as a being. You need to climb Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know? But in the inner realms, <clears throat> in the inner realms, it is uh, the survival, there is no survival. It's not an object, it's attention. Attention is. So I would say after you have studied your attention, you study how you, what is in your attention is being. You look at how, what is in your attention, how it's being in, in different ways as if like the color spectrum, red can have a relationship with blue, blue can have a relationship with green. You know, all, all the different realms are intact, all the contents in the moment, but it's like suddenly realizing all the keys of the piano are part of the same piano. That recognition that 
simple, instantaneous noticing that being is prior to doing things in this life, all fears of the uh, inevitable void for the uh, uh, archetype for the for the egoic construct leave that means you're afraid of something because you can lose it that's it fear is when the creature perceives that if it continues in that path it will become less to itself but so many things in life there's inhibitions, there's there's blockades, there's barriers to it. And unless you actually walk into the unknown, you won't find the new. Everything can be looked at again. And perhaps that is the fate, that is the destiny of the mirror. Guys, the full quote is, a saying of the alchemist is, God is a circle whose center is everywhere and its circumference is nowhere. The saying holds for God, for the anima mundi, and for the soul of man. <clears throat> Carl Jung says, here the point is the center of a circle that is created, so to speak, by the circum... circum... Oh my God, I can't pronounce this. <laughs> circumbulation of the soul but this point is the center of all things a god image this is an idea that still underlies the mandala symbols and modern dreams <clears throat> that's the thing you know this is why i know that if carl jung and sartre met met they wouldn't get along jean paul sartre <laughs> Jean Paul Sartre, his whole thing is he doesn't see an essence to things. He just see he says the surface is the essence. Carl Jung's whole life's work is seeing that everything we're considering to be reality is the surface. I am on the continental philosopher's side. That's it. I would say the this is this could be a very incredible contribution to tr figuring out the difference between continental philosophers and analytical philosophers. Continental philosophers uh, treat what the analytical philosopher treats as the absolute, um, uh, the world of the analytical f philosopher is treated by the continental philosopher as the tip of the iceberg. The continental philosopher is the older brother of the analytical philosopher. Simply said, continental philosophers, like, you know, an older brother and younger brother fight who you think wins. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the older brother might let the younger brother win for a little bit, but, uh, but if the younger brother gets arrogant, then the older brother comes. You know. <laughs> but I was, <laughs> guys. There is something incredible in nature that I would say, unless the spirit of playfulness is witnessed, then the person is going to suffer in the inner realms. Until you can. Be comfortable with the changing world. You shouldn't uh, go into your inner realms. You shouldn't even think about philosophy and psychology. You know? Only when the temporary circumstance of the realm is fascinating for you, then philosophy, mysticism, and even you can start taking steps. Continental philosophers, guys, they are... There's <laughs> there's so many branches of them, too. They're like the, light, uh, the green and the blue lightsaber. The analytical, <laughs> the analytical philosopher is the empire. You know, it's like a red lightsaber. You know? <clears throat> of course, they're both methods. You know, that means on some level, all ideology ever by human existence can be seen just soldiers on a battlefield contributing to the human effort of trying to figure out what this unknown is, you know. Terence McKenna spoke about something that it 
shocked me. First of all, he spoke about a trans. He's, Terence McKenna is a scholar and Shane. He spoke about uh, the tran a transcendental object that is attracting all of us. You know, a transcendental object at the end of time. That means when there is no longer time, this transcendental object and that which has been the attractor is visible. So I would say for me, the question was that how was it not considered to be mind? Because when I look at everything that we are calling human progress, I only see unknown mind trying things out and updating. That means our species has to get ready for a, a language apocalypse. That was the thing, I think. I think that's the end of the linguistic simulation. It's not the end of it, but it's it's the end of being blindly possessed. Now, you know, when a person realizes they are, the, the Chang Su, the Zen master, he was like, the leaps are like leaves on a tree, they change. <laughs> You know, you can believe something. It's true. You know, you can believe it. But tomorrow you're going to be a different person. You're growing in this realm. Because you change, your belief is not the same belief. This is why I feel the word faith is there. Because every day the person's belief system changes in accordance to their eyes changing. That means I, I consider that if I if I was here right now and I drank, let's say I take a sip from this ice caro mugger. I am a different being. I my belief systems instantly are different. I am not I am literally not the same elemental being. New elements have been added to the system. <clears throat> Do you see? There's something remarkable in nature that it's taking turns to exist and to exist as the space and the matter. We could think we are one soul. We could zoom in onto this idea of the soul and suddenly realize we're infinite souls. An infinite regression of structure. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's very interesting. If you're religious, you are in God's mind. If you are if you're a materialist, it appears as if you're in God's mind. If you're a materialist, God is in your mind. <laughs> you know? Either you are in God's mind or God is in your mind. I feel in front of our eyes, God is in our mind. Behind our eyes, we are in truly, you know, an unknown rhythm. That means I don't know if you want to call a drop falling into an ocean, the drop experiencing God, but I would say pretty much there is no, when there is no drop, the unknown is moving itself. When the unknown move, it moves itself and the pilot of consciousness or the advanced communicator notices this, trust becomes very crucial. Trust doesn't mean ignorance. And it doesn't mean, excuse me, obsessive, change but it means you notice the living and you serve it that's it serve the living moment that means it's like <clears throat> I think uh, I would say this is the one of the in my personal view this is for my own universe I'm sharing this the algorithm to the greatest health, health, or life, I would say, I would say the greatest life, is to live for life. That is the only way you can live for life. If you, if your attention is on the living first, then you notice the inanimate. Then you will become an actual human being. Do you know? That means if you get into an, uh, 
you know, a lot of violence is, it's like all wars uh, start in the mind of man. You know? Wars start in the mind, and guess where peace comes from? <clears throat> so let's say we have two people, person A, person B. Person A and person B are about to fight and destroy each other. Right? This has been the pattern. Creatures emerge, they disagree, they break each other. That's it. That's all of violence. This is why, to me, violence is... Honestly, Isaac Asimov, Isaac Asimov was spot on when he said violence is the last refuge of the incompetent. That means you only need to be violent when you haven't found a smarter way to solve the situation. Sun Tzu says, <clears throat> the true warrior defeats the opponent without moving his sword. That means there is many fools in this world that don't value their life. This is why how their identity is in the moment is more important than the actual realistic outcome of the situation. Yeah. We can say even there's two kinds of fools. You know, there's a fool that uh, uh, doesn't know it's a fool and stays a fool. Then there's a fool that knows it's a fool or you, the person ha is temporarily has become a fool. It's, 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 it's like there's an unconditional foolishness and a conditional foolishness. The unconditional foolishness is when the person can't know. It, it has to do, you can say, with the, uh, maybe even the genetics, the DNA, you know? But moments where the person knows, that means if you know you are a fool, you can't be a fool. <laughs> but if you don't know you're a fool, do you know? Then, oh my God. <laughs> That's the whole point of humility. We realize it's okay to be the small and the big. And because it's okay to be the small and the big, then it's super easy and okay to be the big and the small. That means I ask myself, what is this world here for? For what? Is it here to be seen? Is it here to be uh, only just like a behavioral thing? For me, it's as if like the planet is a stoic philosopher, you know, and civilizations are different ways it's behaving, how civilizations move. <clears throat> I feel that uh, our species will mature towards a multidimensionality where we will acknowledge the presence of our Earth. This may be <clears throat> too soon, but maybe in 200 years, we're going to have certain specific people in, let us say, even political systems. Imagine, like, in the United Nations has a bunch of, like, you know, yogis sitting, acting like seers, <laughs> like nature whispers, you know, those who... <clears throat> their emotional language, they are very competent in their emotional language. You know, their emotional intelligence is superior. You know? This would mean that the person can go anywhere and they feel how people's thoughts are arising. Not Maybe they, their attention may not be on their thoughts, but the emotions they pick up and notice. <clears throat> <laughs> And the thing, uh, the only issue with emotional literacy and emotional illiteracy is that it can only experientially update. <laughs> that means if you don't, if you haven't experienced the emotion before, it can't animate. Okay, uh, chat section's popping, all right. <clears throat> Guys, feel free to um, uh, become an archer and uh, 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 shoot any arrow as a question at me, it's okay. <laughs> uh, welcome, guys. Nice, nice. Really, for me, archetypally, I was... Okay, here, I'll say this. Um, today, this morning, not morning, but 
<laughs> but today, um, I was debating between my, I was considering speaking about two different talks, right? One talk was this, From Old Knowledge to the New Unknown. The other title I had written, written was Initiating Elemental Classes for Human Beings. <laughs> guys the reason I say I say anybody can shoot arrows because the <laughs> there's the story of the Buddha where he was meditating where these three sisters three evil, evil sisters I forget their names Mara Mara something Mara yeah these three sisters, three archetypes in Buddha's inner realms throw like arrows at Buddha and Buddha instantly turns all those uh, dark arrows into lotus flowers, right? Which is an implication. Anybody can ask a question. I just catch your arrow and I choose how to answer to it. Too. So it's fine. You can ask anything. I, I, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> I, I choose um, how I grab the arrow in Anyways, back to um, the topic. So we used to know things. Um, and technically, you can say human beings being born and behaving in new ways is kind of like the old knowledge being forgotten and <clears throat> the new unknown opening its eyes and reanimating. You know, for me, the new unknown would be this idea of, like, how many children are going to be born in the future generations uh, they're gonna, that haven't been born yet are going to be born, and how many of those children are going to be defined by the past. That means one thing we can do that I would say is incredible as a species is to give the future generations a chance to realize their world. What does that mean? <clears throat> there was a scene in the movie Enemy at the Gates. <laughs> in Enemy at the Gates, the soldiers, the Russian soldiers were running out, I think it was a World War II scenario, and some soldiers were given bullets, some soldiers were given an actual gun, and if the soldiers ran back, the Russian army would shoot them. They, they would ha accept no traitors to the honor, for the motherland. You know? <clears throat> so it was a situation where the soldiers, some people, I find life is like that to all the kids that are being born. That's pretty much it. You're like being born into this world and you are seeing, in some sense, you're equipped with something. Either you're given... Uh, uh, bullets or you're given a sort of weapon based on the class or where in the world what uh, what part of the planet even you're born in you know all those are factors now we are running in the battlefield so I want you to imagine instead of thinking of all the ways we have classified human beings ultimately we're just a bunch of creatures roam running around on a sphere <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, if really there was no language, we'd be like, oh my god, it's just creatures it's literally so just like, it's like, how far can you, it's like, how far can you go on a sphere? The best thing the past can be for the future is a resource station, is a library, is a, is a backup system. I would say we should treat, every generation should treat itself as a backup system for the next generation. If the next generation messes up, 
ok? Pretty much that's when old knowledge can school the neon node. <laughs> Before that, old knowledge should be a backup system. All beliefs should be backup systems. That means they are there, do you know? But there's also space for them new, for new ways to look at the world. Guys, it could be that the world is flat, the self is spherical, or it could be that the self is flat, the world is spherical. But I would say the planet, I'm sorry to say it, guys, it's a billiard ball. <laughs> <laughs> And it makes sense why it should be a sphere because there is no natural law for a plane for for what is flat i would say if we are our experience is like imagine you drew a circle you 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 drew imagine you had a sphere and you cut that sphere up like an onion you know into slices into very thin slices now a human being on one of those slices may feel like yeah it's flat you know it has to be <laughs> but i would say it's not it's um <clears throat> let us honor the sphere you know let us not uh dishonor uh how incredible the shape of our eyes are there's a reason geometry is happening there is a reason why eyes were here then reason. In my inner realms, I have had conversations with the collective attributeless future. I have been moved and I have moved as a mind and I just see such a fast paced civilization as if if we were to perceive if somehow the right chess moves were made in a thousand years I'll tell you what we could see can you imagine a world where there is no cars why because everybody has jetpacks sound-based jetpacks language has become instant where we no longer speak the vocal cords may hibernate and language will become holographic uh dodgeball that's it. You would be able to throw a sentence at someone <clears throat> as a light hologram. Pretty much, you know, I find anywhere in the world I was in any planet, I my attention opened. Uh, my, my, my eyes would have opened on. I would have first looked at the design. And the design of self in a world <clears throat> is the main thing. Now, two probabilities, either the world is inside the self or the self is inside the world. In front of our eyes again, <clears throat> you are a self in a world. Behind your eyes, you're a world in a self.
So I would say if there is self and world as the most immediate axis, <clears throat> the relationship of the self and world is either singular, this is where numerical language becomes a conceptual law, <clears throat> where if there is a self and a world, that's duality automatically, that means consciousness beyond duality is no longer consciousness. It cannot have shape. So if we're self in a world, <clears throat> let's perceive the self being multidimensional. That would mean it's one earth, one planet, but you can be different. Uh, you can perceive different versions of the world. This is what we're experiencing in regards to what we're calling the phenomena of imagination. It is an <clears throat> movement in an invisible room where you can see the design whether your eyes are closed or open but you can't like you can't visualize an apple pie and take a slice of it you know, you know. <clears throat> so it is information that's all I'm saying it's information in a subtler way that it's moving Too many people talking about power, guys. I'll, <laughs> I'll definitely dedicate 10 minutes of discussion on power, you know. But what I'm saying is if the self is multidimensional, which is what we're experiencing, technically the world is rendered multidimensional. You cannot, it, anytime either the self is multidimensional or the world is multidimensional, <clears throat> there will be, there may be some dissonance but there will be instantly with the multidimensional potential of the world. That means what's going on, we're waking up, <clears throat> you know, every, like the person blinks, there's an absence, let's say, of visual existence, and then they open their eyes again and visual existence is here. Now they can choose to treat every time they blink and open their eyes as a new world, or they can choose to treat it as the same world. I'm saying because we have been changing in the inner realms, because I, like our physical body changes, our ideological constitution as an entity has also changed. <clears throat> so it is. it may be the case that we start thinking, what if the world can change its mind? What if matter is an effect of mind, of a causal unknown mind? Matter is the known effect of a uh, ca uh, causal unknown mind, yeah. <clears throat> that means we don't know can you imagine like a reverse of right now where people were like like people knew everything and people went to school to unlearn things can you imagine that can you imagine knowledge was so accessible that people were like god we know everything. What's the? It's like it's so boring. We have become gods of the inner realm, uh, gods of the linguistic realm, and of knowledge. We have become gods of knowledge, and now what? Do you know? And let me tell you, man doesn't see it, but in Vedic thought, it is acknowledged. Did you know that gods can cry? Not for their greatness, but for how the edge of their greatness has not been seen yet. It is a symphony. It is a symphony of different designs of intelligence. And how the individual lives is how they are playing the potential of their DNA. As the song of the sage. It is fascinating. You know, I have for six years stared at the unknown every day. And that is the ultimate contentment, I find. That every time man explores and gets a new dimension, he wants to hold it. 
I feel the knowledge, if there is, I would say, greater knowledge and greater dimensions, if that uh, knowledge would be accessible rhythmically. That means you are, it's like they say we're using like 12% of the brain, like a tip of the iceberg situation again, even though that was just an article that said that. But I'm saying like <clears throat> there is that suggestion by psychologists. So if we're using 12% of uh, the brain, <clears throat> that technically means that 12% uh, individual, if we surpass individual, is the most likely the rest of it. That means the human brain is not designed for an individual. It's a collective instrument. We don't realize it now. We don't realize it that the greater dimensions of our brain are accessible, but not by an idea. Because honestly, I feel like... <laughs> It's literally this life, it's like you're born, you wear a jersey, you go on the field. And it is simulated in endless games. That means, like, look at how many people play video games. Now look at how many people, life is like a video game. You know, they don't know who's be sitting behind the character. Like, imagine yourself right now, imagine you look into your life and imagine for you this is the most beautiful look at the beautiful nature of the sunset or whatever but imagine to higher dimensional beings the colors we see the world we see they're like pixels Do you know <clears throat> the body is like a pixel for the mind So I would say that if I was right, I'll use myself as an example. If right now I consider I'm a character in a video game, in a cosmic video game. Imagine God is playing video games or, I don't know, unknown uh, laws of nature are playing video games or whatever, you know? <clears throat> if right now it was a video game, I would notice okay I'm a character like let's like here's the thing let's create a mystical video game checklist to make sure to try to see if right now we're in a video game or not first thing what does a video game need it needs a character what else does a video game need it needs a world I look at my physical real life right now I'm like okay I'm a character right now you know and I look at it and I'm like yeah there's a virtual world right now okay so I see those two are met those two criteria of self in a world in a video game okay and it is true video games are made in the reflection of human life but I will tell you <clears throat> just pay look keep this idea in mind so it's the self in the world is the same right now I could totally see myself as a character in a video game and I could see the setting and I could totally see that the purpose of life is like the quests in the video game do you know, and as the person lives, they level up, they update, the new experiences come, comes to them. Now, when it comes to mysticism, I ask myself, when a character, is, when you look at the life, if life was a video game, there is someone playing the character. <clears throat> that means that we are the puppets of the laws of nature. So we are being puppeteered by that. Now we are wondering, is this puppeteering <clears throat> um, from the character in the video game or is there an unknown user <clears throat> who has just logged into this memory of a physical life? And because we're temporary, I will tell you, till the end of time on this earth, the idea of the simulation will stick around. I have no way how to pronounce your name in the chat section, but uh, W001 says, it takes a lot to operate it takes a lot to operate at higher percentages for extended times. It definitely takes skill to prolong 
uh, at higher usage. Hopefully, as we're getting evolved, it will become easier and automatic. One thing is the heart can operate at 1,000% the mind and can be automatic. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the heart is uh, the heart is the my I would say is one of your greatest motivational uh, uh, coaches anytime I have felt lazy in my life I'm like look at my heart not wasting a second of this life you know so I would say yes the heart is giving it everything because it has to and perhaps when we love our species we will give everything because we have to We're temporary. We can't take any of this, you know. The Pharaoh tried. The Pharaoh of Egypt, <clears throat> when he was buried, he made his burial in a giant boat and everything and the whole mummification process in the tomb and all of that, do you know. He literally made a ship and he thought he was taking that to the afterlife, the Pharaoh. Do you know. He was sailing literally the Pharaoh into the afterlife. <clears throat> Pretty much it's such a weird story, you know, the guy built stuff then uh, sailed away from this dimension, you know <laughs> It's like savage. It's like it's like a dictator for no reason Those are the worst kind of dictators when everybody in, in the nation are like buddy. What are you doing? You know, just just like you know <laughs> <clears throat> But we are just voices in the void. I mean, this cannot be avoided. <clears throat> I would say that we will. Yeah, yeah. We are definitely evolving. I mean, if we weren't, then it's like, what's the point? What's the point of living? <clears throat> what's the point of living if you're not, if every day you're not moving towards new dimensions? It doesn't matter if you're even, let's say you're someone who has to, you, you, are, you have a very important role. Let's say you're a speaker at a parliament of a house, you know. <clears throat> it, the whole point is people care for the new. There's something called Occam's Razor where you have to look at the most. It's the simplest idea tends to be the one uh, who goes with, you know. So the simplification of Occam's Razor like going with the simplest uh, analysis, the simplest word of all analysis. <clears throat> I would say we should also have novelties razor. The novelties razor. What does that mean? That means human beings, instead of caring for the simple or complexity before Occam's razor as a filter, we should care for how new is the idea is. I am telling you, anytime you see something new, honor it. It's the divine. It's the only thing that has dared move differently than the past. <clears throat> because it's a paradox. We are all right now, from a scientific standpoint, stardust. Our atoms are ancient. Yet, these ancient atoms end endlessly recycle into civilizations and humans. The heart is your nature. It's your, it's, it's the, any person who hasn't exiled their inner child <clears throat> uh, or hasn't forgiven themselves like, or, um, or can't forgive themselves, it's like you miss out. The heart is where it's okay to be simple. That is the strength of the innocent. You know, they say two types of virtue. A virtue that doesn't know better and a virtue that knows better. The virtue that doesn't know better because it doesn't know, because it's like even in religious texts, it said children don't go to hell. They don't go to hell. Why? Because they don't know enough yet. It's as if the person has to first wake up to a simulation and then want to step out of it. <laughs> but children are too young to even interpret the simulation, you know? <clears throat> I 
I want to read uh, for you um, <clears throat> an essay. As soon as I find it. <laughs> Guys, the source of language, this book I'm reading from you, this book was, uh, I can tell you, I wrote it in 2000, I believe I started in 2015. And then this copy, this manuscript copy came in 2017. But I'll tell you, when I was writing it, it was like, it was not writing. It was like I was mining. I was mining uh, the language of my existence. Do you know? So anyways, <clears throat> this essay is um, called Writing with the Wind. The wisdom of death could perhaps be eternal life, but without the in tune with the cosmos self-reflection. Who is it that truly wants to know? Who is the witness of the individual expression throughout the day and into the abyss of night? Who can write on rainy days without a roof? Beyond thought that creates the God of the universe, there is no you, for it is all one moment beyond counting. Return back to the silence that you are. Beyond elementary forces, you are a witness beyond spoken thought. The unknown is within the known and the known is within the unknown. Language is a biased game for the mystic that has opened the door made of bliss from a cosmic silence. Once you microfocus into the nature of your experience, the experiencer cannot speak, for then the view would shift in design once a new sound has been evoked. He who understands the nature of existential silence will become a friend to, the, to a renunciate of all thoughts. Did you know direct experience has nowhere to go? Begin at the top if you want to climb any mountain. Don't take life so seriously. Simply observe beyond bodies. Speech communicates location. Life is a dynamic experience that must be sincerely lived. You are already an enlightened state of being. What is language in your experience of all that is? When desires are gone, life already knows how to be itself. The winds of change will show us. A person never held a pen. <laughs> a person never held a pen. Consciousness held the world. <laughs> are you a moment unborn? Question mark. And that's how the essay ends. Are you a moment unborn? <clears throat> the body is born. For sure, like that's not undeniable, but the moment, the whole moment, your whole moment is a being. And if there's unknown variables, how can we know we are born? How can we know? How, it's like Terence McKenna has the saying, he says, nobody knows enough to worry. I would say nobody knows enough to know. Who knew certainty in a changing world was a mirage in a desert? You know? This next essay is called Politics is the Market of Fear. Politics is the market of fear. An idea will suffer the consequences of its design unless through an innate natural intuitive depth a truth beyond words has been realized about nature. We are more than the madness of control obsessed ideas. Do not continue lost in an illusion. 
Let every moment be a new finding of truth. If this world was your best friend, how would she talk to you in the silence of all that she had? For how long do words and symbols need to fight the empty page until we realize all phenomena is a mirror reflecting the true nature of the one and only supreme conscious? Oh, sorry, it was a question. For how long do words and symbols need to fight the empty page until we realize all phenomena? Oh, no, no, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> until... We realize all phenomena as a mirror reflecting the true nature of the one and only Supreme Consciousness. <clears throat> Excuse me. Why did Buddha sit under a tree? And why did the tree sit under an endless and limitless sky? If you are caught in identity games, you require to wonder about who is playing this game. <laughs> what is existential intelligence beyond acting names? Look deep within the cosmic eye. What is there more? That who you... Excuse me. What is it? What is existential intelligence beyond acting names? <clears throat> Look deep within the cosmic eye. What is there more? Uh, what is there more? Then... I think there's a typo here. Whatever, I'll read it with the typo. <laughs> <clears throat> Look deep within the cosmic eye. What is there more? That who you ruin you are. The value of deep conversations in life is the same value as clearing the smudges on the mirror of your eyes. We are beyond what we see. How else can we move on? That which changes is also aware and beyond that change. That which changes is also aware and beyond that change. <clears throat> Your intelligence is beyond the stepping stones of temporal worlds that you cross. The source of language is always a moment of awareness beyond space and time. Thought is a curtain. It must be pulled to see the light. The light of one's consciousness cannot be defined individually when it is present in an integratively dynamic collective system of intelligence. Can a finger only in the boundary of its definition possibly realize the cosmic body that it has always been connected to? Beyond who you think you are, you and the universe are all that is. Could there be certain aspects of self that you have not paid attention to? Did you know your whole moment is in God's heaven? A quiet mind hears many things. The eyes of the unknown are not here to throw mysterious stones at knowledge. The study of your sight will lead out of language into a direct realization that this world is more than a story. Are you being a character? Who are you living for? Yourself or the dreams of others? 
What can make the mind realize that consciousness is bliss? Now, do you remember? Those were two essays from the source of language, guys. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> one must find, they must find the strength, inner strength from their inner realms the same way the person would find strength in the outer realms. Only exposure through experience, and it means that the person begins treating the study of their mind as an ultimate existential practice. Like a Shaolin monk in the forest practicing its techniques, every human being needs to look at the presence of their mind, you know, <clears throat> the elegance of their attention. And to notice what kind of pilot they are. And once you as an individual find your individual paradise, you will notice the collective hell. And when you notice the collective hell, you will realize the only thing left is the collective paradise. What that means is no longer avoiding uh, responsibility for novelty and uh, innovation in the world. Uh, if, because we want to go, uh, because we want to, instead of, building earth, building heaven on earth, we want to go to heaven while destroying earth. And this is the, 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 the biggest denial of humanity, that it's an effort. Do you know? That means I feel every, I don't know why they don't do this, but they should. You know, this is how I know we're not an advanced civilization now. Because if there was, let's say, criminal activity done, on the surface of this planet, you know, violent human beings. And these violent human beings were being caged, you know. It would be a situation where it's as if, it's like tr if you treat a person like an animal, they will become an animal to you, do you know? And you will become an animal, why? Because your attention is on an animal. This is the same uh, idea that the person who was enslaved and the person who was enslaving, they were both slaves to each other. That means the only freedom is to break the shackles of the past and run towards novelty. That's the roars of the future advanced communicators. They're not here to, you know, <clears throat> um, thumbs up the inefficiency of a world that could have been efficient. You see, it's all about keeping the dream alive until we awaken to how the dream is actualized. For, similar to a general, in the general's tent, you have your strategy. Then, when you step out, there is a total certainty. <clears throat> as if the way the general is walking on the battlefield, it's as if uh, the earth and the heaven and earth are uh, behind them as his allies. You know. Language has made slaves of people. It has made, uh, <clears throat> it has made nature lose itself. But I will tell you, when you realize how much of this world is unknown, if you just notice, there is so much more unknown. We're literally on an island on, in a galaxy. When you realize this, then pride, arrogance, violence are meaningless, you know? That means, imagine <clears throat> that when the violent person was being punished, they were also given a speech. And they were saying that you failed as a human being to realize that you and everybody is alive once. And every day happens once. And everybody is an unknown mind, moving as a known body, you know? That means <clears throat> people, <clears throat> violent people should be treated as, they should, how can I say it? You either care for the victory of the collective or you will die alone. This is the nature 
It's not even something I'm saying. It's how the system is, you know, where you, we have to care for what we've made so far or become careless and descend into chaos again. The word cosmos, it literally means order. That means the word we're using to call everything in that we can see. The cosmos being the biggest word in, in language. This word just means order. That means there was a lot, everything is chaos. It's just order is the opportunity. It, the time is um, endless times more violent and cruel than the human being. That means it's like, imagine children are crying for being bullied in school. Mystics are in some sense just like, holy shit, time is gonna like a wave wash off everything, wash away everything, you know? Time is, the in, in Vedanta, at least in the Mahabharata written by Rishi Vyasa, time is the narrator. <clears throat> and in the Gita, it is said, time is the destroyer of worlds. And that sentence has been misinterpreted and interpreted throughout history, leading to a tragic and, uh, uh, at the same time, uh, non-tragic and great consequences. You see, time is language's uh, commander. For me, I treat time as a, uh, a life. Time is a life for me. Because the eyes of life can see nothing else. That means it is irrational to conceive, conceptualize death. Because all that we know is the living breath. The living in the breath. You know, it's fascinating. Everybody's being the periodic table. <laughs> it's like every person ever is, is the peri periodic table. You know? <laughs> the person's like, yo, man, I believe, you know, in, in like magic. It's like, buddy, the periodic table is magic. <laughs> Anyways, guys, thanks for listening. <clears throat> I feel what was required has been shared for this episode. Uh, the whole point of this episode was for people to care, to care about the new. And pretty much you can define yourself based on your past. Anytime you look at, you compare what's happening in the moment to the past, you see flaws. Anytime you see it compared to the future, you see potential. It's just imagine 8 billion explorers or hunter-gatherers, let's say advanced builders, you know, advanced designers, 8 billion, okay, 8 billion advanced explorers. And why, what is the argument for an advanced civilization? It's the greatest game that the living can play to see how great we could be is the greatest game, similar to like, some people think what's the best invention to build and the best invention is an invention that endlessly builds inventions you know There is something I will say, guys, actually, before I end this completely. Um, <clears throat> the picture is from this anime, from this Japanese comic book that was made into a show. And it's a very unique story. J 
just this character that's in the picture, <clears throat> there's a point where she is paralyzed by fear and she suddenly realizes the nature of reality and then she f gains full control over her ability and she becomes the greatest warrior in the story. You know, so there is something about uh, one getting an insight about the context that shifts how the, the ability of the concept, you know. That means you, when you're no longer the same concept to yourself, most likely you're living in a new world. So anyways, guys, thanks for listening. I hope this episode was helpful. And um, actually in 10 minutes, I'll be in Discord for 10 minutes. <laughs> so uh, thanks for listening.